Section 7 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sociology in Surge and Straw. The season of irresponsibility is at hand. Come, let us twine round our brows wreaths of poison ivy, that is for idiocy, and wander hand in hand with sociology in the summer fields. Likely as not, the world is flat. The wise men have tried to prove that it is round with indifferent success. They pointed out to us a ship going to sea, and bade us observe that, at length, the convexity of the earth hid from our view all but the vessel's topmast. But we picked up a telescope and looked, and saw the decks and hull again. Then the wise men said, O oh, Shaw, anyhow, the variation of the intersection of the equator and the elliptic proves it. We could not see this through our telescope, so we remained silent. But it stands the reason that, if the world were round, the cues of Chinamen would stand straight up from their heads instead of hanging down their backs, as travelers assure us they do. Another hot weather corroboration of the flat theory is the fact that all of life as we know it moves in little unavailing circles. More justly than to anything else, it can be likened to the game of baseball. Crack! We hit the ball, and away we go. If we earn a run, in life we call it success, we get back to home plate and sit upon a bench. If we are thrown out, we walk back to home plate and sit upon a bench. The circumnavigators of the alleged globe may have sailed the rim of a watery circle back to the same port again. The truly great return at the high tide of their attainments to the simplicity of a child. The billionaire sits down at his mahogany to his bowl of bread and milk. When you reach the end of your career, just take down the sign goal and look at the other side of it. You will find the beginning point there. It has been reversed while you were going around the track. But this is humor and must be stopped. Let us get back to the serious questions that arise whenever sociology turns summer border. You are invited to consider the scene of the story, wild Atlantic waves thundering against a wooden and rock-bound shore in the greater city of New York. The town of Fishhampton, on the south shore of Long Island, is noted for its clam fritters and the summer residence of the Van Plushvelts. The Van Plushvelts have a hundred million dollars and their name is a household word with tradesmen and photographers. On the 15th of June, the Van Plushvelts boarded up the front door of their city house, carefully deposited their cat on the sidewalk, instructed the caretaker not to allow it to eat any of the ivy on the walls, and whizzed away in a forty horsepower to Fishhampton to stray alone in the shade, Amaryllis not being in their class. If you are a subscriber to the Toadies magazine, you have often, you say you are not, well, you buy it at a newsstand, thinking that the news dealer is not wise to you, but he knows about it all, he knows, he knows. I say that you have often seen, in the Toadies magazine, pictures of the Van Plushvelt's summer home, so it will not be described here. Our business is with young Haywood Van Plushvelt, sixteen years old, heir to the century of millions, darling of the financial gods and great-grandson of Peter Van Plushvelt, former owner of a particularly fine cabbage patch that has been ruined by an intrusive lot of downtown skyscrapers. One afternoon, young Haywood Van Plushvelt strolled out between the granite gate posts of Dulce Farniente. That's what they called the place and it was an improvement on Dulce Far Rockaway, I can tell you. Haywood walked down into the village. He was human, after all, and his prospect of millions weighed upon him. Wealth had wrecked upon him its dire fullest. He was the product of private tutors. Even under his first hobby horse had tan bark been strewn. He had been born with a gold spoon, lobster fork, and fish set in his mouth for which I hope later to submit justification. I must ask your consideration of his haberdashery and tailoring. 
Young Fortunatus was dressed in a neat suit of dark blue serge, a neat white straw hat, neat low-cut tan shoes of the well-known immaculate trademark, a neat narrow four-in-hand tie, and carried a slender, neat bamboo cane. Down Persimmon Street, there's never a tree north of Hagerstown, Maryland, came from the village Smokey Dotson, fifteen and a half, worst boy in Fishhampton. Smokey was dressed in a ragged red sweater, wrecked and weather-worn golf cap, run-over shoes and trousers of the serviceable brand. Dust, clinging to the moisture induced by free exercise, darkened wide areas of his face. Smokey carried a baseball bat and a league ball that advertised itself in the rotundity of his trousers' pocket. Haywood stopped and passed the time of day. Going to play ball, he asked. Smokey's eyes and countenance confronted him with a frank blue and freckled scrutiny. Me, he said, with deadly mildness, sure not. Can't you see? I've got a diving suit on. I'm going up in a submarine balloon to catch butterflies with a two-inch auger. Excuse me, said Haywood, with the insulting politeness of his caste, for mistaking you for a gentleman. I might have known better. How might you have known better if you thought I was one, said Smokey, unconsciously a logician. By your appearance, said Haywood, no gentleman is dirty, ragged, and a liar. Smokey hooted once like a ferry boat, spat on his hand, got a firm grip on his baseball bat, and then dropped it against the fence. Say, he says, I knows you. You're the pup that belongs in that swell private summer sanitarium for city guys over there. I seen you come out of the gate. You can't bluff nobody because you're rich and because you got on swell clothes. Arabella, yeah. Ragamuffin, said Haywood. Smokey picked up a fence rail splinter and laid it on his shoulder. Dare you knock it off, he challenged. I wouldn't soil my hands with you, said the aristocrat. Afraid, said Smokey concisely. You city ducks ain't got the sand. I can lick you with one hand. I don't wish to have any trouble with you, said Haywood. I asked you a civil question, and you replied like a... like a cad. What's a cad? asked Smokey. A cad is a disagreeable person, answered Haywood, who lacks manners and doesn't know his place. They sometimes play baseball. I can tell you what a mollycoddle is, said Smokey. It's a monkey dressed up by its mother and sent out to pick daisies on the lawn. When you have the honor to refer to members of my family, said Haywood, with some dim idea of a code in his mind, you had better leave the ladies out of your remarks. Oh, ladies, Mark the rude one. I say ladies. I know what them rich women in the city does. They drink cocktails, swear, and give parties to gorillas. The paper says so. Then Haywood knew that it must be. He took off his coat, folded it neatly, and laid it on the roadside grass placed his hat upon it, and began to unknot his blue silk tie. "'And you better ring for your maid, Arabella,' taunted Smokey. "'What you're going to do, go to bed?' "'I'm going to give you a good trouncing,' said the hero. He did not hesitate, although the enemy was far beneath him socially. He remembered that his father had once thrashed the cabman, and the papers gave it two columns. First page, and the Toadies magazine, had a special article on uppercuts by the upper classes, and ran new pictures of the Van Pushvelt's country seat at Fishhampton. What's trouncing? asked Smokey suspiciously. I don't want your old clothes. I'm no... Oh, you mean the scrap? My, my. I won't do a thing to Mama's pet. Criminy, I'd hate to be a hand-laundered thing like you. Smokey waited with some awkwardness for his adversary to prepare for battle. His own decks were always clear for action. When he should spit upon the palm of his terrible right, it was equivalent to, you may fire now, Gridley. The hated patrician advanced, with his shirt sleeves neatly rolled up. Smokey waited, in an attitude of ease, expecting the affair to be conducted according to Fish Hampton's rules of war. These allowed combat to be prefaced by stigma, recrimination, epithet, abuse, and insult gradually increasing in emphasis and degree. After a round of these, your another's, would come the chip 
knocked from the shoulder, or the advance across the dare line drawn with a toe on the ground. Next, light taps given and taken, these also increasing in force until finally the blood was up and the fists going at their best. But Haywood did not know Fishhampton's rules. Noblesse oblige kept a faint smile on his face as he walked slowly up to Smokey and said, Going to play ball? Smokey quickly understood this to be a pudding of the previous question, giving him the chance to make practical apology by answering it with civility and reverence. Listen this time, he said. I'm going skating on the river. Don't you see me automobile with Chinese lanterns on it? standing and waiting for me. Haywood knocked him down. Smokey felt wronged. To thus deprive him of preliminary wrangle and objurgation was to send an armored knight full tilt against a crashing lance without permitting him first to caracol around the list to the flourish of trumpets. But he scrambled up and fell upon his foe, head, feet, and fists. The fight lasted one round of an hour and ten minutes. It was lengthened until it was more like a war or a family feud than a fight. Haywood had learned some of the science of boxing and wrestling from his tutors, but these he discarded for the more instinctive methods of battle handed down by the cave-dwelling Van Plushvelts. So when he found himself, during the melee, seated upon the kicking and roaring Smokey's chest, he improved the opportunity by vigorously kneading handfuls of sand and soil into his adversary's ears, eyes, and mouth, and when Smokey got the proper leg hold and turned him, he fastened both hands in the plushvelt's hair and pounded the plushvelt head against the lap of Mother Earth. Of course, the strife was not incessantly active. There were seasons when one sat upon the other, holding him down, while each blew like a grampus, spat out the more inconveniently large sections of gravel and earth, and strove to subdue the spirit of his opponent with a frightful and soul-paralyzing glare. At last it seemed that in the language of the ring their efforts lacked steam. They broke away, and each disappeared in a cloud as he brushed away the dust of the conflict. As soon as his breath permitted, Haywood walked close to Smokey and said, Going to play ball? Smokey looked pensively at the sky, at his bat laying on the ground, and at the leaguer rounding his pocket. Sure, he said offhandedly, the Yellow Jackets play the Long Islands. I'm captain of the Long Islands. I guess I didn't mean to say you were ragged, said Haywood, but you are dirty, you know. Sure, said Smokey, you get that way knocking round. Say, I don't believe them New York papers about ladies drinking and having monkeys dining at the table with them. I guess they're lies, like they print about people eating out of silver plates, and owning dogs that cost one hundred dollars. Certainly, said Haywood. What do you play on your team? Catcher. Ever play any? Never in my life, said Haywood. I've never known any fellows except one or two of my cousins. Would you like to learn? We're going to have a practice game before the match. Want to come along? I'll put you in left field, and you won't be long catching on. I'd like it bully, said Haywood. I've always wanted to play baseball. The ladies' maids of New York and the families of Western mine owners with social ambitions will remember well the sensation that was created by the report that the young multimillionaire, Haywood Van Plushvelt, was playing ball with the village youths of Fishhampton. It was conceded that the millennium of democracy had come. Reporters and photographers swarmed to the island. The papers printed half-page pictures of him has short stop stopping a hot grounder. The Toadies magazine got out a bat and ball number that covered the subject historically, beginning with a vampire bat and ending with a patrician's ball, illustrated with interior views of the Van Plushvelt country seat. Ministers, educators, and sociologists everywhere hailed the event as the toxin call that proclaimed the universal brotherhood of man. One afternoon I was reclining under the trees near the shore at Fishhampton in the esteemed company of an eminent, ball-headed young sociologist. By way of note it may be inserted that all sociologists are more or less bald, 
and exactly thirty-two. Look him over. The sociologist was citing the Van Plushvelt case as the most important uplift symptom of a generation, and as an excuse for his own existence. Immediately before us were the village baseball grounds, and now came the sport of youth of Fishhampton, and distributed themselves, shouting about the diamond. There, said the sociologist, pointing, there is young Van Plushvelt. I raised myself, so far, a co with Mary Ann, and gazed. Young Van Plushvelt sat upon the ground. He was dressed in a ragged red sweater, wrecked and weather-worn golf cap, run-over shoes and trousers of the serviceable brand, thus clinging to the moisture-induced by free exercise, darkened wide areas of his face. That is he, repeated the sociologist. If he had said him, I could have been less vindictive. On a bench, with an air, sat the young millionaire's chum. He was dressed in a neat suit of dark blue serge, a neat white straw hat, neat low-cut tan shoes, linen of the well-known immaculate trademark, a neat narrow foreign-hand tie, and carried a slender, neat bamboo cane. I laughed loudly and vulgarly. What you want to do, said I to the sociologist, is to establish a reformatory for the logical vicious circle, or else I've got wheels. It looks to me as if things are running round and round in circles instead of getting anywhere. What do you mean? asked the man of progress. Why, look what he has done to Smokey, I replied. You will always be a fool, said my friend the sociologist, getting up and walking away. End of Sociology in Surge and Straw